the law applies universally, meaning uh, forget about the particular figure of how many people were gracefully granted the possibility of traveling or how many people were gracefully granted the permit to visit the country or even reestablish themselves in the country. The fact is that it's not a right, it's a concession that the, the, the state gives you or retains. Uh, so the, the whole population of Cuba, 11 million more or less living in Cuba, plus about 2 million living abroad, all of us are affected by those laws because the laws are very explicit. You just go through the laws and you will see that they clash head to head with the, the principle of the right to free movement. Uh, how many in particular were granted or not within those parameters, the possibility of visiting or not visiting? I don't know. He has figures, for example, about this group of people. How many? 20,000, uh, 24,000 something that cannot even ask for permission to visit. Uh, okay, that's, that's a particular figure. But all of us, without exception, are submitted to that kind of law that universally affects the whole population. Um, and yes, we are discriminated in many ways. We're discriminated because we cannot uh, join our families uh, whenever we want. We are discriminated because we cannot be part of the national development. Let's assume that tomorrow the, the Cuban government has it right and has a, a great idea about how to push the country forward economically or whatever. We cannot participate unless they change the laws. I mean, there are people who have won Cubans, who have won international prices. There is even, we are very proud of one particular economist, Carmelo Mesalau, who, are, who is the only other recipient of the, of the International Labor Organization uh, Award for Ethics, together with Mandela. Uh, now, he would love to work for the country. Can he? No, he can't because he's considered part of the exile community, part of the diaspora, despite the fact that anybody who can read him, I mean, he's never been violent, he has never been integrated into any, not even political organizations, he's just critical. He has been critical and frank all his life. And very, I would say that within his frankness and his honesty, he has been very considerate in the way that he communicates his, uh, his ideas. Um, And yes, the confiscation of, of, uh, of property uh, has is a sanction for people who travel, uh, I mean, for people who, uh, who leave the country, who are imposed to leave the country. I mean, people who want to, I mean, let me put it this way, people who would like to migrate as any other migrant, meaning not leaving the country, not abandoning the country, just migrating with the possibility of going back and forth, but they are impose the sanction of permanent exit and from then on all the property is taken away from them. And I mean every single thing that they, that they own. And in some cases the government could claim, well, this apartment was given to him by the revolution, let's say, uh, because it, it belonged to the state before whatever. Well, they paid for it according to the laws. I have relatives who had an apartment but before the 1959 revolution. And when they left, the apartment was taken away from them. We're not talking here about the bourgeoisie. We're not talking here about the ruling class previous 1959. We're talking about workers. We're talking about modest people who are ripped from the essentials. And, and they are obliged to travel to an uncertain future with with their bags, you know, like a Jew in the times of German occupation, when they ripped them of every possible belonging, uh, this is simply unsustainable in in the in the twenty first century. Now, what we would like, uh, I don't want to take more time because I want Cito also to to say something. I'm going through the through the questions. Um, I think I'm leaving outside for the moment. They they asked for a question. <laughs> That's a long one. Uh, if we have time, we, we can address that too. 
But uh, what we would like to see, okay, first of all, we would like this to be included in your report. I mean, this, this issue to be included in the report that we have provided you with enough documentation that you can refer to. Uh, we would like you, if possible, respectfully, we're, we're kindly asking this from you, uh, to get in contact with the Special Rapporteurs on Migrants of the United Nations and, uh, and the International Labor Organization and try to work with them so that they can approach the Cuban government because the Cuban government is out of your reach in this organization. But they, they, are, uh, they are members of the Committee for Human Rights, of the Commission for Human Rights, the, the Council for Human Rights uh, in the current situation. And uh, they, should be, they should be called upon this, and they should be demanded an explanation about how they, they're planning to address this issue. And they should be, you know, when, when we were coming here, uh, some people suggested, and we have brought some cases that we will leave with you, but some people suggested that we should bring cases. Well, you have 13 million cases because, again, because it's, a, it's not the violation of, of rights of a particular segment of the population, of a group of dissidents, of, uh, of, of a person that is in prison, incarcerated, because it's, affected, it's affecting the whole of the population. You have 13 million cases. All of us are a case in one way or another. Now, we would like the Cuban government also somebody to ask the Cuban government two things. To make their, all of the legislation transparent, because it's not. I mean, we went through pain to, to bring all that together. Uh, and, and to review all their current regulation, and, and on, I underline regulations to include laws, the Constitution, but also an uncertain number of instructions that are given sometimes in written form, sometimes verbally, that are part of this uh, violation policy. Uh, to make that transparent, to review all that under the light of the international standard uh, procedures that everybody recognizes, and under the light of their own uh, commitments. Because when they wanted to belong to the Council of Human Rights, they said that they would be committed to the international covenant. And they said that when they wanted to be re-elected to the Council, they said that they would sign and ratify the treaties. And that includes the, the right in the, in the political and civil rights treaty, even in the economic and social, in another different fashion, but it is there, the right to move you know, freely outside and inside your country and to establish your residence freely and to come back without any kind of sanction. So these are the kind of things that we would like you to work with other individuals in the multilateral system, with other special rapporteurs, so that this can become an issue. And I can assure you that this will be a giant step forward in normalizing the relations between Cubans. With, and between even the government and the diaspora, which would certainly have a very beneficial effect in creating a proper environment to advance in other issues. So that's, from my perspective, this is what I will be asking the Commission. Thank you. Well, uh, I think you, you cover more of the scene. Uh, the statistic, going back to the, to the statistic, is, is sometimes it's hard to to find the real statistic, for example, of how many people the government have denied the right to, to leave the country. Normally, we hear, we, let me go back to Spanish, because I am mixing my Spanish with my English, <laughs> because I am reading in Spanish. O sea, vienen las dudas. Eh, porque uno más o bien oye de los disidentes que no han, no han dado el permiso de la salida, pero oír de, de casos de, de, de gente que no sean disidentes, pues no es, no es muy, muy común. Pero yo utilizaría, me atrevería a utilizar este, este número. O sea, de 1995 al 2008, 24.600 cubanos lograron llegar ilegalmente a las costas de los Estados Unidos 
y 18.600 fueron in, 